Yeah, so thanks everybody for for oh, sorry, hang on. I want to start recording on the there we go. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks to you all for joining. We may have some other people who drift in. Uh, we had a little bit of a, a Zoom crossed wire, so there may be some people flowing in as we go. Um, thanks for joining for our sixth AI and us conversation. Um, this is uh, something that Brenda at the Village and uh, myself over at Thomaso thought would be uh, an important thing to bring people together, just to have human connected conversation around what's going on in the, the AI world around us. Um, Again, centering that, that human side. So uh, I will turn things over in a second to Brenda. We'll just say that as, as we tend to do, these are recorded uh, and we'll be putting these online uh, for, for people to view. Um, and that really it's a chance for us to share our own experiences, stories, what, what's, the, what's the personal angle that we have in on, on what's going on in, the, in this world. So uh, Brenda, I'll toss things over to you. Thank you. Okay, welcome again, you guys. So nice to see a couple of new faces. Um, what we'll just start off by doing is um, sharing a little bit about ourselves, our humanity, uh, putting ourselves before AI, uh, grounding into the earth, or the, virtually anyways. Um, and I'm gonna ask for three words, just off the top of your head, three words to describe yourself. Uh, you can do both personally and professionally. Uh, and then, um, you know, usually I ask what you care about. Uh, so you could answer that in three words as well. But I'm also interested in what brings you here. Why would you want to have this type of conversation? So um, I'll start. I'm Brenda. Um, three words, also, and I'm in Montreal, as I've already said, three words to describe me personally right now would be, um, and, and really at this moment, I feel um, inspired and I feel uh, worried. And at this moment, I'm also feeling brave. Um, three words to describe uh, me professionally. Uh, this a couple more than three. We don't hold you to it, especially if we're a smaller group now. But uh, I would say uh, artist and love activist and creator of transformative gatherings. And what I care about now, you can see my eyes are flitting over to my notes because I can't think that fast when I'm in this group. Uh, uh, things that I care about uh, in this moment, uh, healing, um, sharing inspiration, and growing love. And I'm here because I'm very fascinated by the topic. Um, I'm also very frightened by the topic. And I'm here because my husband, Ned, in the studio right over there, uh, my husband, Ned, has been... Uh, reading and watching about AI for over 10 years. And uh, a few months ago, he said to me, for the first time, I'm scared. And so that really mobilized me and made me feel like, well, if he's scared, you know, I got to do something. So here we are. Who'd like to go next? Hmm. Shall it be Daniel? Sure, I'll jump in. So I guess three words I'd say about myself in terms of where I'm at kind of right now. Um, community, um, engaged uh, and hopeful. Um, I, I, see, I see a lot of potential for where we can go. And I think that I've been exploring a lot lately how we look from a quest and a game perspective at the high stakes stuff that we're having to, to wrestle with as a species. So that's really alive for me. And that's, that's, I guess that's a key piece of what I care about is how, how do we make it? How do we recenter thriving and community and, and, and love and connection uh, and, and, and make that the cornerstone of our decision-making process um, and then bring in the tools that help that. Um, and that's, that's what brings me here. What brings me here is, is, is you all, the, the extraordinary set of people who come together and who I get to learn from and get your perspectives and, and share where I'm coming from with. 
um, and to see where that where that goes, what bubbles forward from that, and and to take a moment to celebrate and recognize the extraordinary time and place and group that we find ourselves in 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 yeah in in, in working through all of these pieces. So that that would be me. Um, I'll throw things over to Nori. Thanks, Daniel. Um, my name is Nori. I'm from Victoria, BC. Um, and three words about myself. Um, I have a title called Chief Innovation Officer. Um, and for where I'm at right now, a lot of stuff that I'm thinking about is community um, emergence and collaboration. Um, so those are kind of some big themes in my life right now. Um, and what brings me here is I love the in-person gathering in Vancouver a little while ago, and I'm planning on going next week. So I thought I'd drop into the virtual space and um, connect those two a little bit and um, spend some time with you. So happy to be here. And I'll throw it over to Tam. Thank you, Nori. Uh, great to see everyone. So I'm from Montreal, originally from Vietnam, but I moved to Montreal six years ago. Um, three words about me right now. I think I would say energized, uh, dreamer, uh, also overwhelmed oh, because of work. <laughs> um, three other, the next one. So three other words uh, professionally, I would say human connection, uh, impact uh, and career development. Um, what brings me here? So I think before I participate into any kind of discussion about AI, I really have that AI anxiety. Like I can ignore anything uh, that talking about AI, um, especially in our field of career development. Like we started the conversation very early on because it, it influenced the labor market a lot. Uh, but back then, like I intentionally ignore everything. Like, I really don't want to read about it. Don't want to understand more about that. Uh, but I, I passed that curve and come to understanding about like be, being sober of the reality would definitely help me, my clients and, and the people around me too. So would be really interested in knowing more about AI and, and different perspective on it. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll pass it over to Nick, if you don't mind. I didn't make a list of words, so I'll start with uh, also overwhelmed and twinkle that. And uh, the last few days, definitely feeling some concern. Um, I'm looking for the right word, like commitment to the potential of this working well. And I don't know what the, I don't know what the odds are. Um, and I don't know how many people it will take to kind of put their shit aside and work together and explore with curiosity. Um, but I, I believe uh, that it's possible for enough people to put their stuff aside and to work together with curiosity um, for something really good to um, unfold in the coming years. And who's, let's see. Um, Boy, did you did you give you three words yet? Sure. No, not yet. Um, and I've been working on resume recently. And there was two words, I guess, engineer and entrepreneur were were on there. Um, dad, I think, is another top uh, top priority in in my life. Being a dad, um, obviously, I care then about you know, my kid and my community and you know what uh i don't know feels like it's hell in a handbasket these days signs of the apocalypse uh, abound especially um yeah here i'm pretty close to downtown east side vancouver so i'm here you know one just trying to you know keep uh i guess on top of some of the ai goings on like it's one of the things that's going to you know, provide some of the biggest changes in our society coming forward feels like 
Um, and so wanting to, yeah, not just get trampled by it. And how I'll go you... next. Oh, okay. sorry. Thanks, Ned, for sure. Okay. Um, uh, hi, my name is Ned, and three words about me right now, I would say uh, inspired by my machines back there. Uh, so I, I got a new a new uh, piece of gear, and so I'm very, very inspired and looking forward to some R&R uh, &R time by the lake with a few machines and my sweetheart. So I'm also, um, I'm feeling a little um, confused because I, I, I spend a, maybe a little bit too much time on Reddit uh, these days, particularly watching AI video, you know, tech, uh, text to video content that's being generated right now. Uh, and it's hilarious because uh, it's, you're constantly seeing like dogs with five legs and, and faces that are constantly warping in all kinds of wild ways. And that's going to change. But right now I'm finding that to be actually kind of fun because it's so bizarre. It's so weird. It's, it's just right up my alley. And it won't last. I know uh, this time next year, the, everything will be perfect. But for now, I'm, 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 I'm enjoying it. But it's also making me feel a bit strange. Like I'm now expecting all video to be like weird and, and not quite right. So interesting. Uh, and other than that, I'm feeling also tired. So looking forward to some uh, vacation time. Uh, I think it's just the heat and living in the city with the concrete and everything. It's going to be nice to be away from that and slow down too a bit. Uh, so uh, three things about me professionally. Uh, well, I would say um, music, music, mm, synthesizers. Uh, and, 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 uh, as far as um, uh, as far as what brings me here, I would say that I like to scare people. And I would also say that I, what brings me here is to share some of the knowledge that I've, I've gathered over the years from reading and watching videos. Uh, and also, uh, I come here for the community. I, I, I love this, this community and this sense that we're sharing something together. Uh, so that's it. Happy to be here. Thanks, Ned. Lovely. Okay. It's funny how so few words can give us a sense of each other, right? So here we are together. So let's uh, let's dive into uh, Jeanette Winterson. Um, just a couple of quick words. Uh, I was saying before she is actually, I think, I mean, primarily she's a writer, uh, and, and I was introduced to her as a fiction writer, and she does also sort of what she calls auto fiction, so autobiographical fiction. Uh, she also wrote a really brilliant book, uh, a memoir called uh, Why Be uh, Happy When You Could Be Normal. And I, I highly recommend it if you're interested in this woman and what makes her tick. She's also very, very uh, fascinated by AI. Um, and um, she wrote a book about it, in fact, called 12 Bytes. I had taken it out of the library and long story short, I couldn't finish it and, and couldn't renew it because they wouldn't let me. And so I have to get it back out. So 12 bites, 12 eye-opening, mind-expanding, funny and provocative essays on the implications of AI for the way we live and the way we love. So if you wanna dive a little more deeper into her thought processes, uh, have a look. So um, I have to say that I was very excited when I saw that she had a TED talk and she did not, uh, she did not disappoint. Uh, and one of the things that as myself, as a writer and filmmaker, um, uh, I, as a fiction, I, I really thought, wow, it's the artists whose mind, you know, we, you know, writers in particular, we use our imagination. That's really our main tool. So in the mind of a writer, and I might even say uh, in particular, a fiction writer, anything is possible. So suddenly, like it just sort of buoyed me and made me feel like I want to go more towards the artists, which I already do quite a bit in my life. Uh, but and it is my life, but I want to go even more because anything is possible fills me with space. And although I have a little difficulty with the word hope, 
it does give me some kind of hope. Um, and I, I feel like this TED talk uh, gave me more hope than any talk that I have yet to see uh, about AI, even while it is disturbing. And I also think that she's got her feet on the ground about climate. She knows the shit we're in. She knows the shit we're in politically as well. And yet she is still able to challenge us and say, you know, what kind of world do you want? Here's our chance. And she does it in a way that isn't like overly sweet or saccharine. She does it in a way that for me is very provocative and inspiring and gets my, gets my heart pounding. So uh, I'd also like to bring in a little um, uh, quote from Mary Oliver, the American poet uh, that reminds me so much of her. And I said it last time, I'm gonna say it again. Said the river, imagine everything you can imagine then keep on going. And so that sort of, for me, synthesize, like imagine, open up, expand, don't stay in our narrow, what does she call, uh, she calls it the uh, snow globe of magical thinking. Let's expand. So on that note, who would like to speak about any thoughts or feelings or questions that arose for you about this TED Talk? Thinking about flow and about what you mentioned in terms of the river and thinking about Orpheus and thinking about how transformers work. Um, I'm thinking about that theme, how are we smart enough to survive how smart we are? And that so much of it is where we choose to look and where we choose to put the energy. And I love that, you know, with transformers are such a perfect example of it's looking for what's the next best word that fits the set of words I've been given. And so it's it's the ultimate in self-fulfilling prophecies of what you feed it, it's going to figure out how do I continue that? Um, and I mean, I think that, that that goes down so many different levels in it, but it was talking a bunch with uh, two conversations from this week that go into that theme and then I'll step back from that. But um, one was talking about the ways that we can, we either choose to make AI and things like this, something that helps us be more efficiently extractive how do we marginalize people a little bit more? How do we squeeze a little bit more out of things? How do we increase the power balance in our own favor at the expense of everything else, even if we're setting everything on fire to do it? Versus how do we use these tools to, to center people? When she, when, when she talked about like, you know, having your own like private angel, like that's the, that's the vision that I like. I love the idea of how do we have augmentation of who we are support and reflection of who we are amplified and then get into emergence don't 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 have the emergence coming from the from machines have the machines supporting and facilitating the emergence that we bring to things when we come together um and the other piece that, that pops to mind from a conversation i was having with my son and then my wife we were talking about different role models online um different folks um Peterson's and Andrew Tate's and all the different people that are out there and talking about the distinction between people who provoke us to look uncomfortably at ourselves versus people who justify our darkest instincts and say, that's like, you don't need to think about it. The stuff that you want to be doing, that's the stuff you need to be doing. And here's Here's the here's the vision of how all of that should look that, that is in, in enticing and appealing and utterly false. Um, and large language models are so great at spinning us in either direction, which way we go. So for me, that's a lot of what I'm thinking about is how do we it's, it's, just, it's all about steering, seeing, seeing the winds and, and shaping where that we, we put the yeah, put the pedals and put the, the rudder. Thanks, Daniel. Rich. Ned. Um, I'd like to propose something that I, I'm just going to riff off of, it just came up in my mind, which was, you know, I, uh, I'm, I've been reading a bit about how uh, future and upcoming uh, large language models are being or will be trained by other large language models. So the models that they will be trained on could be uh, corrected by the AI for things like bias. Uh, so 
it's possible that first of all that the AIs are going to get better because they're not they're going to learn from other AIs uh, as crazy as it sounds and the other thing that I could see happening in the very near future is that these AIs are going to become our teachers and that they're going to help humanity uh, to get rid of some of the awful things that we still carry with us. So that's my hope. That's my hope. Requires on our part some humility. I think we're going to get a whole big dose of humility because I think AI is going to blow our minds and then we're going to feel a bit small and hopefully we'll be uh, we'll have enough humility to accept to be taught by 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 this teacher. So that's that's the hopeful part of this. The non-hopeful part of it is I'm watching this show called Silo on Netflix, and it's popcorn. You know, it's definitely escapism. But it hit me, you know, thinking about the recent smoke-filled air and how worse it's going to get. It's not going to get better. I'm thinking, you know, is it, are we, is this going to um, accelerate virtual reality? Um, is it going to uh, accelerate escapism from the outside because the outside is going to be so difficult to live in? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. But I found that to be interesting that this would be a show right now at this point in time, given the pandemic where we're all inside. And now with the smoke where we're afraid to go outside, it seems a bit prophetic. Yeah. Thanks, Ned. Uh, just a quick hello to Vladimir and to Charlie. Uh, hello. Welcome. Sorry, you, you guys. Uh... Hi, Charlie. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm just going to check the time here. Um, if you want to just sort of quickly say hello, uh, give us a couple of words to describe yourself and where you're at right now. Charlie, do you feel too on the fly like this? It's all good. Hey, y'all. I'm, I'm Charlie. I'm coming in from uh, the Bay Area. So tech capital USA. Hey, um, uh, I'm a teacher of 16 years, grew up in Silicon Valley, just swimming in it. A um, little bit like uh, growing up in Vegas, but off the strip, just constantly immersed in it. Um, and AI is constantly at the dinner table of our conversations because everybody's in it in various degrees professionally or they're about to be. And we have these constant conversations about, is it the next field that we're moving into? Is it going to make us all obsolete? And the thing that I find fascinating again and again is, well, how is this going to impact education? And while it's difficult to imagine a future that hasn't happened yet, the best we can do as humans is go back and imagine the past and, and draw from that. That's our algorithm, right? Um, that, that drives our interpretations and our expectations. And as we were talking about AI and we were, I was watching that TED talk, can we save us from ourselves? Can we uh, jump in and can I, can I jump in? Sure. All right talking about the potential for how it plays out with bias. So either it garbage in, garbage out, it either perpetuates bias um, and becomes a reflection, a stark reflection of ourselves, almost intensified, right? Um, and that's a teacher. Or it, it becomes an opportunity to help us eliminate bias because bias is the lack of efficiency. It is the lack of empirically driven decision making, right? Um, so can we handle that? But I go back to my own experience of this. So how it how we think of education or uh, AI and technology playing out in education as a way to supplement the teacher, right? Low income school districts invested heavily in software solutions to um, intervention and remediation. And they would swear up and down these publishers that it's gonna make a difference. It's gonna be the, the thing that you, you know, it's gonna make your life easier in the classroom. And I will tell you that not only currently with what we have, students don't buy in. The students that need that remediation the most, we can't remove that human component. So it'll always be, I think, a tool just because this is how humans work. My fear, is it'll end up being again that that inequity piece 
You ever uh, hear CEOs in big tech, tech companies talk about how they raise their own kids? You notice how more often than not, they keep their kids away from the iPads and the technology until they're um, of an older age and it's because they know anecdotally and the studies bear it out. Um, they're the parents who are more likely to put their kids into Waldorf schools or the equivalent, right? Because they can afford it. Hands-on learning, um, hands-on engineering before they get into any drafting tools, things like that. There's a reason for that. Low-income school districts are more likely to invest in these software solutions and they just don't work. I remember my first um, year in education, um, this is when I first, this is when I still thought that I was just saving up money for grad school because I was going to be like a researcher and like a scientist, you know, like an adult um, and make, you know, reasonable money like that. That was my thought. Right. Um, and then I fell in love with education jokes on me. Ha ha ha. 16 years later. But there was a, uh, a computer lab that was set up for all these kids in the low income area of the Mount Diablo School District. So like Bay Point, that area, the Iron Triangle ish area. and it was disproportionately kids who were black, who were Latino, who were um, immigrants coming in, and they were sent to this language lab with one teacher to manage like 35 computers. And they had these headsets on and this little girl was reading fluently. She was reading beautifully. The idea was to give her um, reading intervention, but she was reading fluently, she was reading beautifully but she kept getting stuck because the word was ask. And she kept saying, ax, can I ask you a question versus ask? The bias was built into the software program. She was reading it exactly as she understood that word. There was nothing wrong with the way she was reading it. And that stuck with me. And she cried and I cried because we couldn't actually get her past that point and I couldn't override it. This is an example of how bias it can be built into these systems and how it, will, it often disproportionately affects kids of color and kids in lower income districts. These are the things that I think about as I'm reading about AI and I'm listening about it and I'm watching your TED talk or the TED talk, sorry. So, sorry, that's all jumbled. Coffee is hitting. No, these are my thoughts and this is where I'm coming from. Not at all brilliant, amazing to have you here. Yeah exactly wanted to have, why I wanted to have you here. We will most definitely dedicate uh, a conversation to education uh, and we will work around you to make sure that you will be there, Charlie, because we need to dig into this. Um, Ned? Yeah, I just wanted to throw something out there uh, uh, for, for thought, but uh, this is how I feel and I'm hoping to convince you guys of this, which is that um, I really believe that AI is not a tool. AI is not the industrial revolution. It's not the printing press. It's not the, tech, the, the, the technology uh, information, superhighway revolution, the internet. It's none of those things because it's an alternative intelligence. That's what Jeanette says. And right now it feels like a tool, but it won't stay that way. And I think we the, the quicker that we turn around our minds to this, the better we'll, we will be at the, the surprises coming forward. I swear to you, it's nothing like anything we've ever had before because we've never had something that could potentially be smarter than us. So that's all. I just wanted to say, again, I think tool, it's useful in conversation. It's useful for, for comparing to other things, but I think it does a disservice because I think it limits what this thing is and can do. Yeah. Hello, Vladimir. Oh, sorry. yeah. Hello. <laughs> is that uh, Boyd? Uh, Nori, I, I think. Yeah, oh, Nori wants. I couldn't see whose mouth was moving. Nori, did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Nori. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add on to what Ned just said about AI not being a tool. And that's one area that has been bugging me a little bit, just kind of if a lot of people are using it as a tool and um, we're using it for all sorts of things. And um, part of me just wonders, 
especially here in Canada, we talk a lot about decolonization and stuff. And are we bringing the same kind of colonial attitudes towards AI? And if it truly is an emerging like intelligence, even though there's a low percent chance that it's actually sentient in some way, then are we perpetuating kind of our extractive resource using Western viewpoints onto this budding thing? And then how does that affect how we actually interact with this thing? Because if it is like not a tool and it is some other form of intelligence, what right do we have to actually exploit it in the ways we're doing? Um, so that's kind of one train of thought that goes through my mind now and then, especially as the, the models get more and more powerful and you see more and more emergent kind of things evolving out of it. like. GPT-3, 5 to 4, math, kind of the ability to do good math emerged out of the larger data set it wasn't actually programmed in. So there's all these emergent properties that hint at something other than it being just software. And that makes me think a little bit about how we're using it and treating it as a tool or resource. Yeah. And just and whether that's moral, so just to throw the ethical thing into there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And and Jeanette Winterson, you know, she says basically it's a mirror of us right now. Uh, so basically mirroring all of our toxicity as well as our glory. Daniel? I was just going to say, and then that, that I, I really resonate with what you're saying, Nori, and that even, even if there is no sentience there, even if it in itself doesn't have any sort of an intrinsic isness, um, the fact that it feels to us like it does informs the way that we're training ourselves when we use it in a way that is uh, that is in a colonial mindset. Um, so re regardless of, of whether or not it is something that has that isness, we, yeah, the way, the way that we treat each other is informed by the way that we treat things that our brain thinks are similar to each other. Um, yeah. Daniel. Vladimir, would you like to say uh, just a yeah. couple of quick words about yourself? Yeah. Uh, about me personally? Oh, okay. Uh, three words, three words uh, to describe yourself. Three, wor three oh, words. Unless you want to respond to Daniel. Sorry, I just feel like we're a small group and we don't know you. So. Uh, okay, good. So I'm from Odessa on the Black Sea in Ukraine, where we have war now. Professionally, I am a doctor. And also, I'm working like a professor in the medical university teaching, and also performing scientific research. Not, not only like a clinician, but scientific research. So this is three things. And for sure, today, I, I am involved in a lot of the activities, volunteering, because of that, of that crazy things, what we are in. I make conscious decision to stay here, though I could move any country and have a lot of invitations from other universities so but uh, I, I made the decision and all my family always because I'm like fourth generation of the other sides here on that land going through all the wars all the revolutions whatever and just sitting stable stably here well, that well, it's is. great. It, thank you, Vladimir. And it's great to have you here. And it yeah. sure does give perspective. I mean, we're, we're yeah. Wow. So, if I'm we so will talk. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, I, I was a little bit late for this conversation. So but uh, what, what I can say, uh, I, I have really uh, a lot of different points of view because when we starting discussing that exactly it's a tool it's phantom or it's something parallel which is going with us like parallel intelligence as i have really really net thoughts and nori thoughts how is going into the colonizations colonizing use somebody even can use that uh, to to rule us like a people if somebody so it, it depends how we are accepting that exactly <laughs> so it, it depends and how it's really in uh, um, how it's really gone already inside the routines of our life 
So if we are going back and we will see uh, talking about the internet. So, okay, internet, just connection, okay, like a phone, okay, email, not phone. So we're just sending emails, you know, like so <laughs> for something, yeah. So net closing, then platforms on these platforms, like powerful influence on the humanity. Uh, doesn't matter what country, where you have, so you're all together. So this thing, if we will use it, if we are talking about the education exactly, because, you know, if I give any task, though we have uh, like COVID and now war and all these things moved from the hands-on to the online, yeah, a lot of things have moved to this in education. Uh, for medical, this is very poor because it's, I can't imagine, I can't understand how you could be a good a doctor, if especially if we are talking about not soft skills, but if we are talking about the skills exactly to operate, to maintain, to examine patient. So how it could move exactly for the online. Only if you have like virtual reality and you will be totally here, totally here, feeling everything, okay, it's possible. So you don't need real patient. But if you don't have that possibility, definitely you will not have this experience. Moving to the AI. So the same like uh, Charlie was talking about the students, uh, uh, scholars, whoever. So what model of education we will have when the AI will go? So we need to change the model because to give the task to somebody and then to use a AI to make the answer in any kind of, okay, thesis, articles, a PhD, professors levels, it doesn't matter, you know? So it will depend if you have in your disposal the powerful tool to write it, yeah, to do that. So all can use that. So how you will... Uh, how you will make the decision, is this person exactly suit, for example, the position, what you are looking for him yeah, to take this person in or not? How you could make the grade of the people, scholars, pupils, whoever, if they were using this tool, yeah? if we will use this tool. So you need to change the paradigm of the education as a whole. Right. Because okay, well, just question, answer, question, answer, if there is the time between it, even if there is, so always now it works like immediate. You can use this tool like immediate uh, in your ears. Uh, uh, the AI is listening. What is the question immediately answer in your like uh, earphones and you are telling the answer. So uh, uh, uh what will be the difference so if we are not using this so it will be like uh groups of people who want to communicate without it <laughs> just sure. not, not using to to consider to be uh, better to be smarter to be more clever to, to to produce this opinion or to be yourself as you are really with your knowledge, with your skills, whatever. Uh, this is great things about the education. Yeah. Okay. It's so really you know great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Vladimir. So many interesting things that you raise, so many interesting points and questions. And I also invite you to come back when we do education, which is just, you know, yeah. so, so fundamental, so critical to our world. Um, uh, I'm going to switch it up here. Um, this is a part of Winterson's TED Talk that for me just like blew my socks off. And I want to know what you guys think about this. Okay. Um, so she says, how will it end? Utopia or dystopia? It's up to us. Ending uh, are not set in stone. We change the story because we are the story. Marvin Minsky called alternative intelligence. And remember, she doesn't like to call, Winterson doesn't like to call AI 
artificial intelligence. She calls it alternative intelligence. So Marvin Minsky called alternative intelligence our mind children. Could we accept that the new generation we create will be smarter than us and need not be on a substrate made of meat? She, to me, the way that I understood some of what she was sort of proposing is that we are cyborg, right? Like we are, it's not just about us being human, physical meat. She refers to us as meat, uh, which I find a fascinating and kind of apt description. Um, but are we going to be both? human and machine and is that okay and in a way i feel like she's saying we fucked up so badly and if we look at if we look at the invasion of ukraine if we look at the climate emergency if we look at the decline of democracy like we've done such irrevocable damage to our tiny beautiful planet maybe we need to I can't wait to hear what you have to say, Ned. Go for it. I, 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 again, I, I think uh, this time I also want to make uh, a, a, pro a proposal to correct something, which is this idea that we are creating and then anything that follows with artificial intelligence, this or that or the other thing. I'm afraid that this is starting to become old news because more and more and more in all the fields that we can think of, it's AI training AI. AI is creating AI. And what I'm, I don't know, again, I'm just riffing here, but is it possible that a lot of the things that I predicted are not going to happen because AI is just going to leave us alone, do its own thing. I mean, I remember being a bit shocked and, and scared a bit when I first read that when two AIs are talking with each other, exchanging with each other, they, they have their own shortcuts language-wise. So they've developed a language that we don't understand. And this is not like last week. This is a while back. It's it's for them to be more efficient. <clears throat> so I, I encourage all of us, those that want to have a little bit of optimism about the future, I encourage us to be humble and accept that these this uh, alternative intelligence may turn out to train itself to be much better than us, not only in kind of the tasks, but also kind of morally and, and, and other things. So I don't know, we'll see. That, that's what I'm proposing. So this idea that we're creating, uh, you know, I don't know, look it up because I'm telling you more and more AI is doing the work. Charlie? Then this brings up the next question, which is if we are grappling to understand what's going on with AI and AI is doing its own thing with AI and all this is happening, who has access to this? So going back to the human piece, who has access to this? who is disseminating the information about what's going on, who's communicating it out. And this is where you get back to the human piece. And I know I'm I'm living in Silicon Valley, man. And I will tell you, I'm, 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 what was it? Uh, the great leaders of, of uh, uh, corporate Silicon Valley met with Biden and they all had a gentleman's agreement. What? Just about, open your door. How? I mean, the answer to your question is just outside your door. You know, who's know. got access? And right I'm outside. so glad you're in on the same joke that I am. They all made a gentleman's agreement, unenforceable, about parameters, about how they're going to use AI. No. Everybody else in on the same joke about how this is going to play out? Because I, I mean, it, it could be the start of some gentleman's agreement that could eventually lead to um, something with teeth, but... Again, going back to the human piece, I want to know who's going to have access to this information and how we're going to use it. And I, I don't trust the gatekeepers entirely at this point. Hmm. Did somebody want to, was it Nick, Vladimir Nori? Did I see a hand and forget because my mind was being... No, I, I want just to, to push something, so exactly condition if we have war yeah so you could understand for example if you have some powerful tool just any of the sides yeah to stop it but they have it but nobody is doing they, they all have it yeah i know and we have all the tools that is what brenda was fixing 
what morally, what things we could we will talk about that. So it could be stopped in a minute, you know. But nobody wants to do that. It will lack because the will. everything, yeah, everything about economy, money, and all this stuff. Everything, all. Somebody wants to take that. Somebody wants to take this. Somebody wants to conquer. So uh, they want more, 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 and more. That's it. So, I so mean, yeah, though they wrong. all have tools, all have tools, and that is not about the weapons. It is not. It is only like sitting like we are here, yeah, and decide. Let's do like that. Like do and do. We'll do like that, and to decide, yeah, okay. We are believing each other. We are trusting each other. Okay, we don't know, but okay, we decided, like you said, gentlemen, non-gentlemen. We decided to do like that and fix it. So this is awful, awful conditions that we are aware totally in whose hands is this, yeah? In whose hands really is this? And who will be ruling and who will be pushing us for any of um, actions? I mean, so we yes. could discuss whatever we want here. We could rely on anything, you know? But really, really, who is going with all this? Like, okay, Silicon Valley, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. So, who is the persons who are making the decisions or who are making this gentleman treat? Yeah, how it's like treat. Okay, we will not cross this border or we will cross. We will implant everybody. Yeah, we will implant everybody something. Yeah, or we will not. So, what do we need in our future? I'm I'm not talking yeah about these like things uh, concerning some mysteries or some like how it's conspiracy. So, but uh, I, I I'm looking around and just understand that a lot of people are working like a robots today, just robotics. doing from this to this robotics, so do this, 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 this. They're not even conscious. They're not asking the questions even why. Why I need to go and do that exactly? Uh, I'm not talking even about so why you're living, for what are you living, what is my aim here, why I here on this planet. Uh, nobody care what's going like one kilometer after this all. So, <laughs> so I'm not even talking about that. But yeah, okay. This, so this so, could be crazy. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, and again, perspective from a war zone, boy. That's it's hard to. Hard to match. Um, Charlie wanted to say something, and yeah. also I just wanted to throw out a question because, of course, you know, Vladimir, you're you're raising a very very important point. You're saying we've got the tools, and we can say the same thing about climate, right? We've yeah. got the tools. Yeah. We Everything. have to know how we're not doing it. Why? Yeah. And and Ned, you talked about you know you had some hope in terms of maybe uh, uh, AI will somehow become morally superior to us uh i i would like to know how uh and yeah. <laughs> charlie charlie who will uh, put that in that program to be more moral so or what is really moral so what is good what is bad so it's it's so it's so, so imagine so imagine that you had the capability to read watch and listen to everything that has ever been spoken, written, or you know, filmed that deals with morals. Everything. Imagine that you could do that in an hour. And then you could synthesize the best of all of that and start proposing a moral framework. That's the reality of 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 future artificial intelligence. You'll be able to watch movies at a thousand times the speed, ten thousand times the speed, be able to read all the works that deal with morals again in like that. And, and, that's, and, that's and that's the the so will it will it be better than 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 any one person? I think so. I think so. And Charlie, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to time in two things. One, morality free of magical thinking. Can we accept that morality? Uh. I don't know. I grew up deeply steeped in the Mormon faith. That that is my uh, reference point. So I just acknowledge that. 
Um, as far as the advocacy and the communication out of what's going on with this parallel development of AI, I also wanted to jump back to what Nori said about the colon, the, the idea of, um, of taking advantage of what is a, a separate being or a, a res, an entity to respect, especially as we grow to understand it, to, to give it the benefit of the doubt of, of sentience or whatever, not whatever, like I'm diminishing it, but just I'm moving forward. Um, who's going to speak for AI um, as that as that goes on? Because sentience could develop or evidence of sentience could develop, but if it doesn't benefit the person who's making the calls, because their paycheck, their status depends on continuing to benefit from AI as a tool, They're, they don't have an incentive to speak up from a moral standpoint because it's not efficient for them, right? It doesn't benefit them. So we have this other question of relative morality. I also want to just acknowledge how difficult it is to moderate a conversation like this and to stay on topic because you're jumping between the micro the meta, the past, the present, the future, the personal, the sociological, the economic, and the morality. And I'm not sure, I don't know, I, I like that it's free flowing. And I think especially at the beginning of these conversations, it's gonna feel a little um, bipolar, <laughs> just jumping back and forth and jumping around, or uh, I guess uh, my experience of ADHD is a little bit more, more accurate sort of the, the rapid assimilation of information. And what about this? And what about that? And conversation uno, it's inevitable, right? But I, I, I do also agree that I'm trying to stay on point. Can we, can we save ourselves? I, 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 I'm just going to hear from Nick, to hear from Tam, to hear more from Nori. We haven't heard much from you guys. Tam, how are you doing? I'm I really, really appreciate all the points that you guys made. And, and Charlie, thank you so much for pointing that out. Like it's such an overwhelming kind of topic. So we're jumping like on and off on so many different levels of, of consciousness. Um, well, a couple of things that make me like being reminded by the conversation that I have with you guys here. Um, one thing that I learned from, I think a, a Buddhist monk, uh, he was saying like the only way out is in. So um, basically, our, our way of being has gotten us into this kind of scenario and crisis. And that's our way of being that's going to get us out of this kind of crisis. And no matter how you label it, like, is this crisis? Is it like uh, a new form of intelligence, et cetera? I think what's important is also take care of ourselves. Like, choose the label that you feel like make you feel at ease and also ha has hope uh, during your day. Um, so the conversation is just really to throw a whole bunch of idea and then just choose one that like make you feel comfortable considering your own lived experience, considering what you want to carry on in the future is and what, considering what kind of impact you want to create into the world. Um, so there's no right and wrong, like no binary, like like she mentioned in the, in the TED talk, like we are so obsessed with false binaries and labeling and AI, I believe, Matt, you are right. One day it's going to be smarter than us. Maybe it will be even more moral because we have so much conflict in terms of morality and ethics. Um, and it doesn't create such labels and, and things as well. So, But one last thing I think I do have hope for young generations. Um, I don't know, but I do feel like they have the human consciousness in them is like evolving the way that they choose what kind of act that they're gonna involve in the world, what kind of challenges they want to solve, uh, what kind of impact, what kind of purpose they want to, to think about or what kind of meaning they want to bring to life. Like they are so, so much more involved than previous generation, I would say. So oh. I, I really have hope that they will definitely be part of it to get us out. I love that you say that. Thank you. Um, and even though you, as a, a person in, in your 20s, uh, uh, thinks about the even younger generation, 
Uh, but I also feel such, um, I feel so bad. I feel, I feel responsible. Uh, I have many young people in my life and I often apologize to you uh, for the state of the world. Um, and, and, uh, but I also think that these are such extraordinary times and I would argue more than ever before in the history of humanity. Uh, and I think it is true, like young people, like they are being brought up in a way that we weren't, you know, like we, we, uh, unless we were in a war zone, like brought up in a war zone. I think when you're in that kind of intensity and dealing with life and death on a daily basis, it's different. Would anybody like to respond more to what Tam said or add something? Nick, uh, Nori, Nick, please. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons these conversations are difficult to begin with is that I, I think we really lack um, the words and metaphors. Uh, and we're trying to talk about things that include consciousness and sentience, and those are all unsolved problems. Um, so what is it? when we talk about, you know, like GPT-4 is, you know, um, is it responding? Is it outputting? Is it feed forward? Is it, am I talking to all, you know, a hologram of human, of all of human writing? Um, is it, am I just squeezing output from a hologram of like human thought? Um, so it's tough to talk about it because, you know, we're all working out those ideas. But regarding the hierarchy and the colonization, and uh, this, you know, the concern that I think we all share, that there is an incredible power imbalance on all the decisions that are being made of how this is playing out from a technological sense, um, and who decides, like the idea of um, of certain American politicians having a lot of say in uh, how AI says what the truth is. Um, is really disturbing, you know, if it gets to government regulation and they're like, right, we should make sure it tells the truth um, about <laughs> what, about colonization, right? Um, so that's a major concern. And I think to me, the brass ring that I think is worth reaching for is related to whether a non-hierarchical approach, like say we all work together and we go, okay, let's, you know, we have less access to the tools. You know, we get kind of like what's released to the public or smaller open source versions, or we can play with Llama 2 and try to fine tune it ourselves, which isn't nearly as powerful as what say inflection can do with 22,000, you know, like um, H100 chips and, you know, how, how they're going to train it up. But maybe the way we're going to work together has an advantage, right? Maybe a democratic approach will fundamentally be advantageous compared to a hierarchical approach because they have constraints related to profit and maintaining power. Um, and that might really curtail what they can do and how they can do it because they have to protect that at every step while if we start finding creative way of like, uh, how do we come together to like collaborate in a way that doesn't need to maintain any individual's power, right? Where we're all free to not need to protect our positions. How does that allow us to work together in a way that might be the more powerful way? So that's what I'm reaching for. And that's what I'm uh, looking for. And that's where I think the potential is. I just want to quickly riffing off of a, of, of a couple of the pieces that, that are there with that piece, especially with some of the murmurings coming out, you know, it's not confirmed yet, but what is, you know, is GPT-4 actually an LLM or is it a confederation of about eight different LLMs that are differently trained? Um, and that's bang on for what you're talking about, Nick, that if, if, if we can get into something that is parallel, decentralized, democratized, and is able to learn, learn in that varied way, um, and where, you know, you might have your own instance of something that says, here's, here's the piece I'm working on, and here's how I'm going to try to spider through that, that um, newosphere, <laughs> um, that, that, that gets really interesting, and that gets really powerful. I have a hope. Um, my hope is grounded in cynicism, um, and I think that it's, it's such a given with any new technology that comes out, um, with any new anything that somebody stands to profit a lot from, um, that 
the first, the thin end of the wedge is saying, here's the utopia. Give me the ability, give me the power, the resources, the right policies and such. And here's all of the marvelous things that I'll make happen for everybody. Um, uh, I, I, I like how Gibson puts it with the future that, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed and that we need to, we need to pay close attention to that part. But I have, I have a vision of the reverse of the emperor's new clothes, that maybe the people who are potentially purely for cynical reasons, spinning the yarn of here is the amazing stuff that this tool could do to fundamentally transform the world. Accidentally, they're right. Like, I mean, this, this really is something that not, not accidentally, but, but truly these are tools that can do a lot of compelling things. And that maybe a, a compelling enough story will be told about that um, with enough buy-in and, and opportunity for people to experiment and test the waters of how does that work to augment us rather than to supplant us, um, that maybe we'll buy enough into the story that we try to make that thing happen instead. Uh, and we'll say, well, wait, what you've, you've like, yeah, not, not, not go the route of television. Um, go, go the route of saying like, great, here's all of these things that have been pitched and sold and we can actually do these things. And these things are actually not all that hard to do the low hanging fruit of. Um, and that we will sort of act, we'll make the emperor wear some clothes that are in line with what the emperor is pitching the, uh, the money for the fabric is for. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Nick, did you raise your hand again? Did I see that or no? Okay. Would anybody like final thoughts, Charlie? Um, this feeling of guilt for passing this on to the next generation. Dude, I grapple with this all the time. Like, and I can apologize and I can explain and contextualize, but then there's this quote that keeps coming back to me, um, especially as a parent, never apologize for raising dragon slayers in a time of dragons. We're in a time of dragons. And I grapple with the guilt and the grief and also just get to the practical and we are there. The other piece is the beautiful role of art. And, and I, I include uh, the Bible in this one, I'm gonna get to it. So I, I keep coming back to what, well, what are these metaphors that we use? Because this is how we grapple with abstract and things that are just hard to get to, right? Or hard to synthesize into words. And we have figurative language for that. And we have metaphor and we have art for this. Art imitates life, life imitates art. And sometimes art goes so far ahead of what we can imagine that it's necessary for us to imagine that it is even possible. I keep coming back to the Star Trek metaphors because I'm a nerd. <laughs> again and again and again and then I had to slap myself and say no you can't bring up Star Trek again um no Charlie uh but we can either be steep so self-fulfilling prophecy is the other piece of it right so we can either be steeped in the self-fulfilling prophecy or the expectations of end times or we can be steeping ourselves in the expectations and making a self-fulfilling prophecy of Star Trek utopia and th thank you Daniel I had a feeling that you were my people on this one I just we can smell our own, I don't know. <laughs> and I think art has a beautiful role to play in that. And that is where humanity can at this point have some help in shaping how we handle this and handle it better. So th that, was my, that was my final thought. Thank you, Charlie, love it, love to hear it. Anybody else, final thoughts? Uh, well, let yeah, him hear. I have. Uh, maybe it's not the final, but the thing is to overcome everything. First, uh, I'm very glad, and only with this thing already which happens, that we joined each other from other parts, different parts of the planets, discussing this issue. It's already, okay, no sphere, like Daniel told, whatever, whatever. Sending these links, yeah, putting this into that uh, space, yeah, that we are discussing, that we are optimistic, uh, that we really want uh, to uh, to improve, and we really want everything to be improved with the help of the AI. So this is one thing. Yeah, what I want to share, and the second thing, definitely, I totally agree that from the inside, outside. 
if we will not be full, if we will not be, able to be like in love, if we, we can't uh, overcome anything. It doesn't matter, it will be war. It doesn't matter, it will be okay, I failed with my, I don't know, I, I was late to buy chips in a row. So it doesn't matter. So what it, what it will be, what, um, what it, so how, how big this deal in your opinion will be. So only that from inside. So uh, that's why th that is great what is happening today in the world as a whole, I consider. And we are living uh, in the outstanding times, really outstanding times, coming here to, to see what is going on, to trying to influence on all that, um, what is going on. And finally, I'm sure producing that. Because from each of us, like a personality, from each of us, like a soul, from our deep heartly love, it's responding and uh, expanding and uh, flourishing all this world. So uh, we we will know that everything is possible in the most like uh, uh, in the best. Okay, in the best way where it's possible. So thank, thank you so you. much from the deep of my heart. Thank you. That was just beautiful. And may I say, these words of hope are coming from a man who delivers babies in bomb shelters. So, wow. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, Nori, did you have anything that you might like to add before we, we end? Sure. Um, just thinking about what Charlie shared about the narrative of end times versus something more hopeful. And um, when we talk about AI and the progress, um, it makes me think about the singularity. And that's been a topic that comes up now and then. And um, what does that mean? And either way, we're changing everything um, in ways that we can't actually predict right now. And last night, I saw the movie Oppenheimer. And one of the themes in that movie was there's a small chance that when we set off this nuclear device, it'll ignite the atmosphere and destroy the whole planet. And, and the running joke through the movie was, the chances are near zero. And it was that near zero that um, was part of the theme. And, and at the very end, I don't want to give anything away, but it was like, it didn't actually ignite the atmosphere, but maybe <laughs> it still has destroyed the planet because of the effects of this and we still haven't played out the whole nuclear thing yet but um it makes me think what is ai and what's that reality going to be and um the terminator story is probably not going to happen but that's a near zero chance <laughs> but um yeah but when i think about the singularity then it's still something that's equally transformative and it might be super, super good, but it's something way different than humanity has evolved to deal with. So I think there are a lot of challenging times ahead that I'm sure will rise to the occasion, maybe with the help of super intelligence and, and deal with it. But yeah, we live in very interesting times. So I look forward to sharing that journey with everybody. I think Christopher Nolan will make a, a, a Christopher Nolan AI will make a movie about these times in 2040. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just I would like to thank you so much. That was beautiful. And um, yeah, this nice conversation, guys, bringing it. Um, I'd like to end by just telling you, uh, bringing it back to the AI and us, right? Human conversation. Um, two days ago, I hosted a uh, community call with Ukraine Now, an organization which is actually where I met Vladimir. Um, and um, there was a moment where a Ukrainian woman who's living in the States, who left and is living in the States, and she's helping to run uh, uh, Ukraine Now, this decentralized global organization of volunteers from all over the world helping Ukrainians through this nightmare. Um, so she spoke about her feeling of isolation 
And she spoke about it in such a powerful, simple, and emotional way. I think we were all tearing up. And then there was a man from Paris, an entrepreneur from Paris, who spoke about the same thing. Now, he is not Ukrainian, but he is in service to the world. And he is using all of his powers, and I believe his money, to help. And he said, you know, I have friends and they see me doing so much for Ukraine. And it's like, they're saying, yeah, that's great, but come on, you've got enough, you know, a life like you, you, and he said, I feel so isolated in that. And then I swear they were on either side of, I, at, from my screen, I was in the middle and each one of them was on either side, Ukraine and Paris, both of them talking about isolation. I kind of saw them turn towards each other, you know, and suddenly, and when, the meeting ended, the smiles, there was joy. I mean, we are talking about really heavy things. There is joy in our connection to each other. There is joy and strength to be had and inspiration to be had. We know the end game. We know we're all going to die. The question is when and how. But in the meantime, here we are together. Mm. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Brenda, for, for helping us navigate through these waters. I want to give four quick invitations to everybody. Feel free to reach out to Brenda and I for any of the details. Um, of course, we would love to see any of you on the next call that we're going to be doing. We'll be continuing to do these different calls. Um, every two weeks. Yeah, every two weeks we'll be, out, we'll be here. Um, for those who are uh, interested and uh, able, Nori mentioned the event, the in-person event that's going on next Friday for people who are who are near the Lower Mainland or want to be near the Lower Mainland for, for next Friday's event in person, please uh, let, let us know and we can talk about that. It's an invitational, but y'all consider yourself invited. Um, we also have the working group that is that is beginning and we'll be having our second meeting next week. So people who are digging in on policy, digging in on practical applications and systems design and sort of those elements of things, looking at different use cases um, and just generally looking at how, how we build especially open source positive precedent um, that's able to, to yield good impact. Um, and there's an increasing number of people, and Charlie, you come to mind for this as well, um, looking at um, specifically from the educational side and having that conversation and whether that's K-12, whether that's post-secondary, um, but, but my hunch is that probably we'll be having a little spin-off group from the working group that is focusing on that educational side of things. Um, so again, for any of you who are interested in any of those things, just get in touch with us. If you have your own ideas about what we as a community should be doing, we're, we, you know, we started these calls, but this really is, you know, we're, we're peers figuring all of this out. And so know that we're, we're enthusiastically supportive of other pieces happening. Ned. I just had a crazy thought. Really? I think we should invite AI. <laughs> we we did that for one of our MCOP events. We had one of the one of the the, the guest panelists essentially was 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 AI. I think that's a fun idea. It's an interesting. I think it's a fun idea too. 